Nature's rule number one. If it's the same color as a highlighter, don't touch it, don't lick it, and just stay the f away from it. While this seems like an easy rule to follow, the internet is filled with viral videos of people who were unaware of this unspoken rule or who just ignored it altogether in an attempt at 15 minutes of fame. We'll be going over a few of them. While these tiny, beautiful, seemingly harmless creatures might look fun to touch, there could be deadly consequences. Why does this already sound like a news segment? My name is Lindsay Nicole, and you are watching another segment of What the f is This? As always, we're gonna get the general information out of the way. If you're familiar with the series, you've seen this cladogram, which represents how big groups of animals called phyla are related to each other. All phyla, except for the last one, chordata, are invertebrates. So it shouldn't come as a shock to you that all the animals in today's videos are invertebrates, once again, like every episode in this series. There are millions of species of invertebrates, meaning every single person, including every single scientist, is unfamiliar with the vast majority of them. There are simply only so many species our little brains can keep track of. And so what surprises me the most about today's topic is not how many of these species are known to be toxic. No, it's how many people are willing to touch something that they don't know. That feels like something we should all be able to agree on as a species. If you don't know it, don't touch it. So, as a tactic to avoid being harmed or eaten, many species have evolved the ability to produce poison or venom as a defense mechanism, of course. And to eliminate that chance even further, evolved a physical warning signal that they are practically screaming, stay the fuck away from me. This is known as aposematism. Aposematism, aposit. Posematism. <sighs> Aposematism. Aposematism. Like astigmatism, which is something I have, but I keep breaking my corrective glasses. Aposematism is distinct or conspicuous colors that tell a potential predator, if you hurt me, I'll hurt you tenfold, bitch. You know, for a long time I thought conspicuous meant like the opposite like camouflage or invisible, because it just sounds like it, conspicuous, it's very mysterious. When in reality, it's like conspicuous in your face. Aposematism as a warning does not just apply to deadly consequences though. It's generally just coloration that an animal has to tell the world that they're toxic, disgusting, or just won't provide any benefit should one choose to indulge. It's the same effect as the TikTok guys wear their hats like this. One glance and your common sense should tell you that this creature is not a good decision for you. Shout out to all my Instagram followers who recreated this classic look. Think of skunks. You're not gonna die, but it's not gonna be pleasant. Aposomatic coloration is such a successful strategy that it's evolved in at least a third of all animal phyla multiple times. By the way, this isn't complete. This is just as many as I found before I quickly gave up. But it evolved multiple times, so clearly aposematism is affected. Yet, our first video exists. Here, we have one of the most venomous marine animals in the world, and this person decided to pick it up and try to feed it a tangerine. This is a blue-ringed octopus in the phyla mollusca, along with squid, slugs, clamps, and other things of that nature. And while this particular video went mega viral back in like 2021 on countless news stations and everything, this is not the first time somebody has been ignorant of this particular warning signal. Okay, so let's break this species down, or actually the genus down, because there are four known species of blue-ringed octopuses that are all working with the same thing. And quick fun fact, there are multiple plural forms of octopus. Octopi, octopodes, and octopuses. I like octopuses. <laughs> so, blue-ringed octopuses are found in coral reefs, rocky sea floors, and sometimes tide pools in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. This particular video was taken in Bali. And like their name suggests, and as you saw in the video, they're named after the numerous blue rings that appear all over their body when threatened. So they're a little bit different than the typical examples of aposematism that we can think of immediately, like uh, poison dart frogs that are always displaying their warning signals, always telling everyone to fuck off. The blue ringed octopus only tells you to fuck off when they're feeling uncomfortable or unsafe, using color changing cells called chromatophores that they have all over their body in combination with special light reflecting cells called iridophores. Iridophores. Ir Mm. Think iridescent, iridophores, absolutely radiant. Okay, so if they only display their blue rings when they're feeling uncomfortable, what do they look like the rest of the time? Kind of like a rock or the inside of a crevice, since they spend most of their time tucked away inside of one, minding their own business. So for that reason, it's pretty rare to see them. Despite this, scientists have been able to describe four species, with potentially more to be discovered in the future. There is the greater blue ringed octopus found around Indonesia and the Philippines, and I think Japan. The lesser blue ringed octopus found around Australia. The blue lined octopus, which yeah, has blue lines, in combination with the blue rings, pretty cool. Also found around Australia. And I don't feel like pronouncing this. This one has only been found a couple times, so it doesn't have a common name yet. Let's just condense it to Hapastrazi. I don't know. Hapastrazi has been seen around India. So, what makes the blue ringed octopus so venomous? Well, they produce an extremely potent neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin, or TTX for short. To detect it! Tetrodotoxin is produced by lots of different animals, including some salamanders, the polyclad flatworm from the last episode, and most notably, pufferfish, and more. But I'm 
I'm gonna stop the list there. Because I know what you really wanna know is just how toxic the blue ringed octopus can get. Definitely enough to kill a human. Definitely, like I said. Some sources have mentioned that a single octopus can hold enough venom to kill like 26 people, but in a it is said kind of way. So toss that. I'm gonna give you concrete data. In 2019, a team of scientists looked into the toxicity of the greater blue ringed octopus found around Japan, specifically how it's distributed because their bites are toxic, obviously, but they also have venom kind of all over. So no, you cannot eat them, by the way. I bet somebody already asked that in the comments. There have been multiple reports of food poisoning after people ate blue ringed octopus that accidentally made it into different fish markets. So avoid that. Anyway, the toxicity of the blue ringed octopus in this study is measured in mouse units. One mouse unit is the amount of toxin it takes to kill a mouse in 15 minutes. Morbid, but take it up with science, not me. Anything above a thousand mouse units per gram of tissue is considered strongly toxic. So guess what the octopus's salivary glands had a toxicity score of? Just guess, 9,276 mouse units per gram. It's over 9,000! 9,000! 276. From a regular human safety perspective, I'm like, God damn, that is fucking terrifying. But from a scientific evolutionary perspective, I'm like, God damn, that is impressive. Their bites are apparently nearly painless. And so many people never realized that they got bit before the symptoms started kicking in. Which, since tetrodotoxin works by preventing nerve cells from producing electrical impulses, are symptoms such as muscle paralysis, respiratory failure, and eventually death. With no antidote that we know of so far. So how do you prevent getting bit by a blue ringed octopus? Don't touch them and definitely don't pick them up. Next, here's the thing. Pretty much every single animal content creator has made at least one video about this creature because there is an abundance of videos of people doing things with them that they definitely shouldn't. The content is just delivered on a silver platter at this point. So if you've been on the animal side of social media long enough, you probably know this is not a jellyfish. This is the Portuguese man of war. Related to jellyfish and kind of look like jellyfish, but very different. Their tentacles can get to over 100 feet long and deliver excruciatingly painful stinks that on very rare occasion can be deadly. So let's break it down. The man of war is a siphonophore in the phylum Cnidaria, along with jellyfish, sea anemones, and coral. Coral's an animal? Yes, bitch. That was a shock to me too back in the day. Although the man of war kind of looks like some weird jellyfish, they actually kind of live a lifestyle more like coral. Both corals and siphonophores are colonial creatures, meaning they have tiny little individuals called zooids all living on the same body. They can't live separately from the colony. They're connected to each other by tissue. It's kind of a weird concept. I guess kind of like leaves on a tree, but in animal form. To be honest, I haven't really looked into ideas of how colonial animals evolve, but I would imagine that it has to do with how they grow. In the case of the man of war and other siphonophores, the colony gets larger and larger through a process called budding, which is a form of asexual reproduction that's Cloning. It's cloning. Other animals reproduce through budding too, but the individuals end up completely separate, like some sea anemones. They can clone themselves, but then the individuals are still individuals at the end of it, and they don't rely on each other for survival. They just do their own thing. Maybe at some point, multiple times, there was some sort of restriction made to that budding process, and the individuals didn't completely split, and then became permanently connected at tissue. I don't know, it's just a wild guess. Especially since I don't really know much about coral other than the fact that they're colonial animals that live attached to the sea floor. But anyway, back to the man of war, which unlike coral is not attached to the sea floor and is kind of on the move. Using their gas filled pouch called a pneumatophore to float on the surface of the ocean, drifting to wherever it takes them with the rest of the colony and its deadly tentacles hanging beneath, waiting for prey to bump into them. Well, it's easy to assume that all the zooids in this lump under the float are all doing the same thing. That is actually not the case. The zooids are specialized, meaning they all do different things. So some zooids are in charge of feeding, some of reproduction, and some of defense or prey capture. This is where the gnarly sting comes into play. Unlike the tetrodotoxin of the blue ringed octopus and other creatures, the man of war has a different pain delivering service that actually other cnidarians like jellyfish and sea anemones have as well. Nematocysts, cnidarians, nematocysts. These are the structures responsible for the childhood trauma of being stung by a jellyfish at the beach and maybe having to pee on your leg to stop the pain or having to get someone else to do it for you. Here's how they work. The nematocysts have this little coiled thread that's kind of like a trip wire. When it's triggered, this little harpoon-like structure shoots out called a nematocyst tubule. It kind of acts like a needle, penetrating the prey's skin and injecting different types of toxins into the target. And in the man of war's case, those toxins are extremely strong. For humans, typically delivering terrible pain that lasts about 20 minutes, accompanied by welts on the skin and nausea. And severe cases can have chest pains, difficulty breathing, and on very rare occasion, death. And technically, if we're being truly technical here, this is actually not an example of aposomatic coloration. It's technically the opposite. Because the color of their float allows them to blend in perfectly perfectly to their open ocean environment. So actually everything that I said at the beginning about aposematic coloration only applied to the blue ringed octopus because the next one, why the fuck is there no space on the memory card? That makes no sense. 
just gonna get through this. I don't know what was saved, so um, there's uh, another day of filming where shit is just going terrible. We'll, we'll get there. So I actually said all of that at the beginning to actually only apply to the first animal, the blue ringed octopus, because the next animal blends into the ocean too. But I will argue from my own personal opinion that by the time the animal washes up on the beach and you're deciding whether or not you should lick it. I'm gonna lick it. Liar! Anybody want to pee on my mouth? No! God, please, no! Let's do it again. Ladies and gentlemen, the Darwin Award goes to... Ah! Their blue coloration should tell you not to, thereby making it aposomatic in that specific circumstance. That is my own personal opinion. Thank you. Here is example two of my opinion. Guys, by the way, never try this. This is incredibly dangerous, even for a professional. Nah, they're, they're chill. It was, in fact... Not chill. This is Glaucus Atlanticus, also known as the Blue Dragon, another mollusk that is not afraid to fuck your shit up if need be. This particular mollusk is a type of nudibranch or sea slug, which are some of my favorite marine animals. Here's why. Many nudibranchs have a superpower, one that you would expect to see in a Marvel movie, the ability to steal their prey's defense. Take this eolid nudibranch, for example, some of my favorites. They like to snack on sea anemones, which, like the Man of War and other Nidarians, have those nematocysts. Instead of being harmed by the nematocysts like any other ocean joke, they evolve ways to deflect the stinging blows and actually recycle the structures to use later on. They get passed and sorted through the digestive gland and then stored for defense later on. Other nudibranchs, like the leaf slug, use the same method with plants and become solar powered. Those chloroplasts that allow the plants to photosynthesize and make food from the sun get recycled by the leaf slug, which allows them to temporarily photosynthesize themselves. They make their own food from the sun. Could you imagine if we figured out how to do that, dude? That would be fucking insane. So in the blue dragon's case, their prey of choice is the one and only man of war. Just like the man of war, they drift on the ocean's surface with counter shading that allows them to blend in perfectly with their open ocean habitat. This tiny, inch long species has not only evolved to be immune to the man of war's deadly defenses, but also repurpose these potent attacks for their personal use. And so touching them when they wash up on shore is like a game of Russian roulette, because there's a chance you won't feel anything, but there's also a chance you'll be feeling the wrath of a man of war. And so once again, to prevent being harmed by these creatures, don't touch them, don't lick them, and just stay the fuck away from them. And before I go, if you're a returning viewer, I have a few questions that I wanna ask because I'm looking for some suggestions. I'm still figuring out what the fuck is going on since this channel is still new. First off, would you prefer if I was sitting down? It was brought to my attention by my best friend that most YouTubers sit down and it might feel more natural if I was sitting down. I personally think I would automatically be more calm if I was sitting down and that's not necessarily the vibe I'm going for, but I don't know, I figured I'd ask your thoughts. Second, I'm thinking about starting a Patreon. I've gotten a lot of requests for one and so I'm figuring out how to set it up and what to offer. So if you're interested in that and have any suggestions on what I should offer, let me know. What you would like to see, let me know. And last, I'm absolutely loving this format and the research and the process of filming it, but I'm looking for ways that I can occasionally diversify my content without having it be like something crazy. I've decided I'm gonna do a quiz every 10 long form videos of this format, but I want to get a little creative with the time in between that. Because to be completely transparent, I need a little research break this week so that I can avoid burnout. So I want to have things that I can tell myself, hey, okay, uh, let's take a break this week and do something a little bit more laid back, get a good work balance back. So here's a list of topics to choose from that don't require really any research or writing a script so I can keep up with posting consistency. I don't exactly know what those videos would look like. Maybe a frequently asked questions. That's literally all I came up with. So since you're part of the development of this new channel, I would love to hear any ideas like that that you would be interested in seeing from me. I know that was a lot of things, but I really do value your input and use it to improve sound quality, add to ideas for the future of different topics. So I would love to hear from you if you have any suggestions. And if you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe so you see where we go from here. You can keep up with my daily short form content on TikTok and Instagram. Instagram. For now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya! But in reality, it's like conspicuous in your face! That was way too much, right? When in reality, it's like conspicuous in your face. There we go.